Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Fred Martino. Our topic today couldn't be more important planning our communities for the 21st century. AARP is involved in this effort, promoting a livable communities initiative across the country. On its website, AARP notes that one in three Americans is age 50 or older, and it asked, is your community a great place for people of all ages? It notes by 2030, one in five will be 65 or older. Will your community be ready? To talk about this and more, my guest is John Robert Smith, Chairman of Transportation for America. He became Chairman in 2012 after leading Reconnecting America as President and CEO. And prior to his role there, he served as Mayor of Meridian, Mississippi for 16 years. He recently visited Las Cruces to talk about how New Mexico's second largest city can plan its future. And we should note that he is not speaking on behalf of AARP. Mayor, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you, Fred. It's good to be back in Las Cruces. I was here about 20 years ago, and I'm so pleased with the positive changes I see here and the vitality that's returning to your historic downtown. It is great to see. I've been here a little more than a decade, and even in uh, that amount of time, there has been a lot of change. Many of our viewers may have heard of the term smart growth related to what communities around the country are trying to do. How do you define smart growth? Well, Fred, besides being chairman of Transportation for America, I am also senior policy advisor to Smart Growth America. And at Smart Growth America, we believe that whoever you are and wherever you live and whatever age you are, you should be connected to the opportunities to create a thriving life, connection to jobs, to education, to health care, to the daily needs of life. And that is true whether you're a small child, a young millennial in the workforce, or an aging boomer like I am. Mm -hmm. um, at its simplest, smart growth is about how you design the place where you live and then how that place shapes the lives for the better of those who live there. So it's in land use, it's in transportation, it's in uh, healthy foods being available, it's in how we can grow and age in our hometowns and find a meaningful, thriving life there. And it's not just for big cities, it's for smaller places as well. And I've worked, as I shared with you, in 10 years in 120 different cities and towns, 121 now that we're talking about Las Cruces. And I have found that smart growth is the way to build communities that not only thrive, but that are affordable for the future, and it works in all scales. Well, I know smart growth relates to lots of different things. One I wanna focus on, and it's particularly important to the city of Las Cruces, is our downtown. You have, as you said, traveled all over the country. You've seen the revitalization of downtowns, how they're making a comeback. How are they different from the downtowns of the past? And can these new changes be sustainable? Well, you know, Fred, we abandoned our downtowns in many respects after World War II. Uh, returning GIs were pushed out into what became known as the suburbs. And we would have this seemingly uh, seamless transportation uh, that would connect us, the freedom of the automobile. And now, and that has worked for decades, but now that is less viable than it once was. And you see, we have built cities and towns ever since there was civilization in much the same way. Smaller blocks, very walkable, close to where he works, close to healthcare, close to the corner grocery store. We're now understanding, and this is not new, we are, we are reawakening to the fact that those 
that form of connectivity, that form of land use and development of cities and towns actually makes your life a more enjoyable, less stressful life. So we are embracing once again that which made cities and towns great from the very first time people came together in a civilized society. But to make this work, transportation and walkability is important, if you can talk about that a bit. And, and we have to rediscover that. Mm -hmm. A street or a road is not just for the automobile, it's for all users. And I think we've forgotten this in many parts of the country. So it is for the automobile, but it's also for transit. It's also for bikes. It's certainly for the pedestrian. And all have to be safe within that built environment. And Fred, keep in mind, this doesn't bubble up out of the ground. We have leaders at the local level and state level that make choices about how they build infrastructure, how they um, develop and use and land use, where they put affordable housing, um, where they put uh, schools, hospitals, health care. All of that must be taken in concert when you're rediscovering the heart of your community. Uh, we did an analysis that 500 large corporations and businesses, home headquarters, had moved into downtowns from their remote location in five years. Hmm. That's 505 years, so we called all of them and asked them why. We thought we knew, but we wanted to hear it from them. And to a company, they said, the coming workforce is that young millennial. And we can't get them to move out to where we are. They want to be in downtowns that have a sense of themselves that are connected. So we're moving to them. And that happens not only in big cities, it happens in smaller places like Conway, Arkansas. Drew three tech firms and the presence of those firms said, we can get the worker for the future we need to live in Conway because it's got a cool downtown. How about that? That's really great to hear and uh, certainly advantageous for a lot of these communities. It leads to more and more economic uh, development if you have people uh, in one place, living there, working there, playing there. Um, we talked about the term smart growth. There's another uh, term that relates to some of what you're talking about. It's new, fairly new to me, but I want to give you a chance to expand upon it a bit. Complete streets. Well, Tell me about that. Fred, complete streets is back to what I said about the streets being for everyone. And it's how we design our streets. We also did a report about called Dangerous by Design, and it rates the metropolitan statistical areas about their safety of the streets. Florida leads the nation in uh, pedestrian and cyclist fatalities, mm. but it's the way the streets are designed. Mm. So Complete Streets takes a new approach to every time you expand or redevelop a street, think of all users and not as an aside, let that be your first thought. We're going to redesign this for all users of that street, including pedestrians and cyclists. And then pair away from that if you have to, but let your commitment up front be, I want a walkable community. I want to be able to walk across that street safely. So little things like how you bulge out the corners, how you delineate the crosswalk so it's very clear, not only the pedestrian, but also to the, the driver of the automobile yeah. that expect pedestrians here they have the right of way, protected bike lanes, and here you have New Mexico uh, State University here, and for those students to be connected into your downtown, wouldn't it be great if you had not only a transit connection there, but bike connections as well? Yeah. And this does not have to be an expensive undertaking, and it doesn't have to be done all at once. It can be incrementally um, executed to improve that completeness of the street. Sure, and certainly we've seen some of that in Las Cruces with more streets having bike lanes now and more people in our area being able uh, to do that. Speaking of uh, Las Cruces, you know there's been a lot of work to revitalize downtown, complete changing, speaking of streets, the, of the streets, having two-way streets to have more visibility of businesses uh, down there. Uh, what 
are some of the next steps in your view that city officials should be thinking about, the best advice you can give them? Well, first of all, you've opened up your downtown again. At one time it was closed off. That didn't work. So now you've opened it back up again. And as you add new structures, uh, you are adding those that are authentic to Las Cruces. So your downtown's going to look different than my hometown of Meridian, Mississippi, and that's wonderful because they tell different stories. And you've got to know what your story is in Las Cruces. And then you've got to tell it to me as a visitor, but you've also got to be able to articulate that story to your own residents, to your children and grandchildren, so they understand the importance of that place. Now, I, I am so pleased with the very positive steps that have been made here in Las Cruces. And the good news is the things I would recommend your city leaders are already thinking about. So that transit connection that is of a scale that fits Las Cruces, from the university, for example, into your downtown, that's already in discussion. I want to fully support that. That is a very economically viable choice to make. It's an, it's as much economic development as it is transportation. Uh, certainly the wide sidewalks, adding additional bike lanes. Um, those things that are already being considered are the next step. And see, Las Cruces is not only in competition with other cities in New Mexico, it's in competition with Meridian, Mississippi. It's in competition with Missoula, Montana, uh, or towns in Vermont or Maine because of a similar uh, population size, we're in competition for those bright young workers of the future. Yeah. And we can choose to have a place that they say, that speaks to me. Yeah. You know, Fred, the millennials are different than we were. We found a job and moved there. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. They find the place they want to live that speaks to them and they find it in the downtown. It's not in the service station on the interstate. It's in your downtown. They find that place, then they find the job. Why did I wait until I was 40 to figure that out? <laughs> well, you know, I think the millennials have a healthier view of what's important in life than perhaps we did. Yeah. You see, millennials don't collect things, they collect experiences. Yeah. They travel more. 26 percent of millennials don't even have a driver's license. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, you know, when you turn 15 or 16, Couldn't wait. you had to get that driver's Gotta have license. It. Now, the, <laughs> the Chevy is not where they gather their friends to go out in the evening, it's that cell phone. That's their Chevy, that device is what connects them. And they wanna be in places where you can walk to the restaurant or the corner bar or where the performance is is being held that night and meet a thousand friends in a clique. So they, they also value the time they have when they're not working. And in so many of our cities, we'll spend an hour or two getting back and forth from work. Well, those sure. are hours we don't get to recover. Yeah. They understand that and yeah. they want to enjoy those hours with people who are important yeah. to them and I think you mentioned you were a, uh, a member of AARP, as I am as well. Uh, Fred, you know, we have a limited number of hours left on this planet. Do I want to spend it behind other automobiles on the highway? Mm -hmm. No, I want to spend it walking to dinner, having a glass of wine and walking back and being safe. Yeah. Of course, not everywhere is uh, in walking distance, and you have uh, experience uh, with this as mayor of Meridian, Mississippi for 16 years. Uh, you guided the development and the construction of the Southeast's first multimodal transportation center, Meridian Union Station. I understand that includes rail, it includes buses. Uh, as you know, Maybe you went through this. Public transportation is a tough sell sometimes outside of really big cities and metro areas. Tell me how you managed to sell it and how it's going. Well, you say it's tough to sell it. This was 30 years ago for it, and no one knew what a multimodal transportation center was. Sure. So it was especially tough at that point. But I sold it. It was an economic development project. 
uh, we had a dead downtown. Uh, my two children and I were the only ones who lived within close walking distance of that downtown. And we had the place to ourselves after <laughs> five o'clock at night. Well, that's not healthy. Yeah. And if you allow the heart of your community, which is your downtown to die, it eats away at the rest of, of uh, your hometown and your community. So I sold it as an economic development project that if you have different modes of transportation that connect in one place, that synergy of people using that transportation, maybe they'll buy a cup of coffee, maybe they'll buy a meal, they'll spend some money in your downtown. Fred, that project has leveraged $160 more for every dollar we put into the project. Wow. So if I can give you a $160 a return on every dollar you invest in my project, I think you'd jump at that chance. And so we sold it to the public as a return on investment. I was a Republican mayor those 16 years, admittedly quite some time ago, but I believed I owed my, um, ta my, my uh, taxpayers, those shareholders in the, in the corporation of Meridian, if you will, a return on how I spent their dollars. And we built this center. I was not at the head of a vast army when we did it. Well, we did it my first term. And it, lived, it quadrupled the land values in the downtown. Uh, it was part of growing our sales tax revenue 60%. Uh, but it really changed how young people felt about their hometown. Yeah, so it's worked well. It's worked well. Uh, one of the things that uh, AARP talks about is a livability uh, index. Transportation is part of that. Another issue, as you know, is housing, affordability and access. This is one, uh, Mayor, that, as you know, I'm sure you hear about this as you travel all over the country, people are really worried about because we are, it, it appears as if we're seeing uh, another bubble developing uh, just as happened before the last great recession. Uh, we see home values far exceeding inflation. And so this is a really tough one for communities. How do we make this work? Well, you have to get, you have to address affordable housing before the turnaround occurs. Mm -hmm. Because once the property values begin to skyrocket, you, you've lost it. You can't mm -hmm. get back in with affordable housing. And especially when you talk about affordable housing for seniors, you want to make sure you put that housing where there are transit connections, where it's walkable, where it's close to get fresh food, um, or where it's close to a facility that get, can give you health care. So often we put affordable housing in remote areas because the property's cheaper, so we put individuals there, which is terrible for young families uh, with small children, but it's even worse for seniors. So don't put affordable housing for seniors in a remote location. Put it right in the heart of your community so that they aren't dependent on a family member picking them up to take them somewhere. They can walk out the front door and walk to a grocery where they can buy good fresh food. Yeah. Don't put that housing in a food desert. Yeah. Where the only thing you can get is a fast food meal. Yeah. And of course for, I, I assume for uh, families and others who may not choose to live, for instance, as you're talking about in a downtown or a central metro area, they want a little, a little land around their home, this sort of thing. This gets back to transportation it again, does. doesn't it? Because you see communities around the country where that sprawl has occurred and the roads haven't kept up with the sprawl. So well, you have and, traffic jams and, and it's a mess. And the transit hasn't kept and up And the transit with the hasn't sprawl. kept up. And that's up. why sure. I said we're committed to whomever you are and wherever you live. Sure. So that doesn't mean just the downtown. Real, real quickly, I want to go through some of these other aspects because I find them really important and interesting. Another one is neighborhood, access to life, work, and play. I think Las Cruces, it, like many communities, is doing a better job with this, with parks, with large sidewalks to walk around, other things that you think are central. Yeah, I was in Denmark two years ago um, as part of the Gell Institute there. and. It was studying how the Danes approach play 
that play is a critically important of their, a part of their everyday life. And of course, we Americans schedule everything about around our work. <laughs> well, when you build public parks, when you build recreational opportunities for both ages, because as we grow older, we want to see those young children at play, whether they're ours or not. So very consciously building in public spaces, parks and neighborhoods, plazas and squares in downtown, all of those things help build that livable lifestyle, yeah. regardless of age. And that sense of community. Uh, another one is environment, uh, clean air and water. Uh, certainly this is a bigger issue, I think it's safe to say, for millennials than it was for many uh, other generations. They are environmental activists, if you look at polling. Um, sometimes this comes into conflict with industry. Uh, in New Mexico, we have a big oil and gas industry. There's certainly always in any community some desire in some part of the community to have manufacturing because those tend to be higher paying jobs. How do you balance this? Well, millennials are especially concerned as a generation, Fred, because they're going to pay for the sins of prior generations. Yeah, and yeah. They, they see this happening, and they see it happening all around them. I see it in my native South, um, so it, it's already impacting this country, and, and you see it here. Uh, so I, I applaud the millennials and those of other generations who take the charge that we are responsible for this planet and all that live on it and um, we need to take that responsibility uh, very clearly. Yeah. Um, now, for manufacturing, understand only 10% of this nation's economy is in manufacturing now. It's changed. Yeah. And even that is smaller manufacturing. That doesn't mean the jobs aren't there. Yeah. And the, the beauty is that smaller scale manufacturing can happen right in downtowns. We're not talking about manufacturing belching smoke. Right. Yeah. Very little of the future manufacturing is going to be that kind of hazardous so manufacturing. Try, try, to, try to attract those manufacturing jobs that don't do damage to, to the environment. Another thing that communities I know are trying to attract are healthcare facilities. I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we have an aging population, uh, certainly on all the lists for the best place to retire, healthcare is part of that list. And this is part of the AARP's livability index. Do you think communities ought to develop you know, incentives to get more healthcare employment? Because this not only helps the folks that live there, but of course it, these are great jobs that are not gonna be outsourced. They're clean jobs and they're very good paying High jobs. High paying jobs, right. You, know, you won't get someone to work in a hospital for 18 to $19 an hour, yet in manufacturing that's considered a you know, many communities that'll jump through hoops to get 18, 19 oh, dollars sure, an hour jobs. Sure. Healthcare jobs are really well paid jobs. They're clean jobs. We can't outsource healthcare jobs. They yeah. have to be where we are. So um, Meridian had three large regional hospitals there that were all started by private families, physicians. Now they, two of them have merged. Healthcare was an important economic development factor for us because people want to move to a place. So we're, we're a smaller city, 43,000, but we're the retail, medical, employment, educational um, trade draw for 350,000 people in seven rural counties. So if Meridian disappears tonight, they're either gonna have to all move or rebuild Meridian. Yeah. Healthcare is a large part of the draw that bring those dollars into our community. Yeah. And so as mayor, the hospitals would use me to also recruit physicians to move in so that we could literally do everything in Meridian or within an easy access to, yeah. to um, the University Hospital in Jackson. But, but to draw those healthcare providers, again, you have to have a quality of life in that little town. Yeah. So what do I do? What does my family do? I make a lot of money as a health care provider. What do we do when we're not working? Well, that led us to the restoration of our Grand Opera House that now draws entertainment from the Kennedy Center in Washington to perform in Meridian, Mississippi. Yeah. So it suddenly gives you, um, again, back to that sense of place, which is about arts for us. It's an 
economic draw for us. Sure. It's an economic development draw for us. Ties into the next uh, element that a AARP talks about engagement, civic and social involvement. Las Cruces is working on this in a whole variety of ways. You mentioned plazas. We, as you know, in downtown have a new plaza. The final one, I, I only have about a, a minute and a half to go here, but I want to touch on it because it, it really goes beyond government, and that is opportunity, inclusion, and possibilities. Uh, one of the things Las Cruces has done that I've never seen done anywhere that I've lived is that they're helping to fund what are called community schools because we are a low socioeconomic area. These community schools, uh, we have one, Lynn Middle School, give access to parents and students to social services, and the city is helping the school district fund that. That's one inclusion and opportunity uh, aspect. Quickly, what are some others that come to mind for you? Well, of course, seniors can be an important part of that sure. inclusion yeah. for those children who don't have two parents at home or maybe even have a parent at home. So that's another role seniors can play. A lot play. of volunteers, too. But, a lot of senior volunteers. But today's boomers are a different aging population than we've ever known before. Um, sociologists say we're experiencing adulthood too, <laughs> which is better than a second childhood. <laughs> but we're continuing our jobs. We're starting new jobs, new careers. We're moving to towns so and we're becoming very engaged in that community. This isn't a generation that wants to rock on the front porch. We want to continue to learn, continue to travel, continue to give back into that community. And AARP provides a tremendous workforce volunteer workforce in most cases that can be applied to the needs of a city or town. Yeah, and it's so important to draw on that life experience. It is. There is some value if you're if you're a lifelong learner for being on the planet for 70 years. Yeah, you yeah. actually pick up a few things. <laughs> you sure do. Mayor, it's been a delight to talk with you. Well, likewise, Fred. Thank you. Thank you for being here. That is our time for now. Join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's morning edition, 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by here and now, noon to 2, and all things considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org. We'd love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmaker.